Hello, kitties. Be sure to subscribe. And click that bell. Yeah, yeah, Freddy, yes. Click the bell, that way you know of all the new slasher mayhem brewing in the 80s slasher library. And click that like button, or I'll make sure you never have pleasant dreams again. And be sure to follow the 80s slasher librarian on Twitter. Join the Facebook group and the subreddit. The links are in the description below. Join now, or playtime will be over. <laughs> this upload is brought to you by the patrons of the 80s slasher librarian. Alleyway, Bonanza Jellybean, Bree, Carl Eakins, Cecilia Spears, Allison Seib, Hawaii, Iron Alexa, Jay Gardner, Catherine McClear, Kristen K, Lauren Vaught, Liam Anderson, Michael, Ryan Woodward, Sean Campbell, William Schaefer, and Willow Ravenwood. If you would like to support the 80 Slasher Librarian YouTube channel, then check out the merch store and the Patreon page. Links in the description below. And enjoy tonight's narration. Librarian. <laughs> okay, boils and ghouls. Tales from the Crypt, Demon Knight, Chapter 3. It was nearly 11.30 when Sheriff Parnell Tupper finally arrived at the scene of the crash on Highway 47. He had been snug in bed and pleased to stay there for the rest of his life, thank you, when Mavis called from HQ in Junction City to roust him, demolishing a very nice dream in progress and setting the stage for a lousy night. Something about a fender bender out near Wormwood, that boarded up polished shit that still dared to call itself a town. While his wife snored her usual symphony in B-flat, Tupper had rolled out of bed propped his considerable bulk on his skinny legs and staggered to the bathroom to unload a day's worth of piss. Ever since the wife, Addie, had decided to go to business school, he had been forced to stay home during the days to babysit Chucky, the five-year-old rugrat that Addie swore he was the father of, but looked suspiciously like the next-door neighbor, red hair and all. Tupper hated night shift work, worse than he hated rattlesnakes, but Addie knew how to lay down the law. Besides, when she graduated from school, she might land a job, and he could cut to part-time. Up and about, he had thought about taking a shower, then said to hell with it. He thought about changing into a fresh uniform, then said to hell with it. He went downstairs and thought about taking Chucky someplace for a quick DNA test, but it was too late to find any open labs, so to hell with that, too. In the end, he drove through Junction City and caught Highway 47 South. It took some 20 minutes just to get to where Deputy Bob Martell's cruiser was sitting, dead on the road with all its Christmas lights flashing. There was a pall of smoke in the air that smelled bad. Tupper eyed the wreck as he pulled up and stopped. Jesus friggin' Christ, he grunted, fetched his official Diamond County flashlight off the floorboard and got out. 
Deputy Martell had put orange flares all over the road and was standing just past the wreck waving directions at an approaching car. He looked back and nodded, then jerked a thumb over his shoulder. Look at what I found, boss, he was thinking. Tupper looked. A thought popped instantly into his head. The memory of seeing the space shuttle explosion live on TV. These two cars had exploded then melted together. Red hot sheet metal glowed at the base of it. The tires were still burning. Pools of steaming glass were hardening on the asphalt, which itself had burned up some. Tupper ducked, squinting. One of the fried license plates indicated New Jersey. A hell of a long way to drive just to die in a crash in New Mexico. He skirted the wreckage. The plate might say New York, might not, since it had curled up like a pretzel. He went to the nearest car and shined his light inside. He had seen incinerated bodies before, but it was never pleasant. Considering the amount of heat still pressing out from the debris, the temperature must have been upward of 2,000 degrees at its peak. But whoever had been inside wouldn't have minded one bit. These bodies would be found in chunks and pieces that had nothing to do with the fire. Martell wandered over. Suppose we ought to call an ambulance? Tupper looked at him. Below his mirrored sunglasses, Martell was grinning like a baboon. He loved this kind of shit, being the eager beaver and all of that. It was probably the closest thing to a war he had ever seen. Tupper had heard all his tales about the military and the artillery. There could never be enough bombs in the world for Bob Martell. Call for a wrecker, Tupper told him. Tell him there's no hurry, though. This mess is going to be hot for another hour or two. Have you done your diagram? Diagram? Martell quit grinning. I have to diagram this? How about the accident report? Done that yet? He shifted uneasily. I've been directing traffic. I I'll do them later. Any witnesses to this? Martell shrugged. Just me, I guess. You guess? He squared his shoulders. Just me, I was chasing them down. So you were involved? You'll need a Form 286. No problem. Tupper nodded. Any luck finding body parts, anything ejected? We don't want the coyotes dragging some guy's head away. Well now, Martell said, frowning. There was some kind of ejection. The guy in the convertible, uh, he pointed to it, jumped out before impact. I, I think he rolled down in the ditch there. Tupper looked. So where's he at now? Burned up, I guess. At least, there ain't nothing down there no more. What do you mean, nothing? Bodies don't just burn up. The skeleton can't vanish. Go look some more. Martell heaved out a sigh. Fine, I got nothing else to do. I don't get off at midnight or nothing. He stomped away. Keep an eye out for parts of other people, Tupper called after him. We want to keep this tidy. Ain't going to be no others, Martell said over his shoulder. The guy in the Cadillac already headed east. Tupper almost choked. Come again? Deputy Martell turned. He scratched his hat, looking befuddled. That's funny, I almost forgot all about it. He ambled back, frowning, looking suddenly groggy. This guy comes out of the wreck, and he asks me which way the other guy went. So I says east, and he says thank you, and he just walks away. Now Tupper frowned. Martell was no bomb-dropping wannabe war hero. This wreck had put him straight into shock. He took him by the arm. Come on, Bob. We better sit down a minute. Martell let himself be led. What for? I've got a bottle of water in my car. Straighten you right out. You say a man walked away from the crash? Uh-huh. He was real nice. That's why I can't figure out why the other fellow was shooting at him. Tupper took a long breath as he walked. Iron Man Martell had watched one too many war movies. You looky here, he said. You did a good job on the flares and we can leave for a while. What you need now is a lot of rest. Maybe a nice cool shower. My shift's about over anyway, Martell said. I do feel kind of funny all of a sudden. I'll just drive straight home. No driving for you, Tupper said. He passed the old galaxy that was all lit up red and blue and white. Enough warning for any traffic tonight that this was official police business, and fed Martell into the passenger seat of his own cruiser. He got in behind the wheel and deliberated for a moment. Take Bob all the way back to Junction City? 
That would be almost a whole hour down the drain. Wormwood was only a mile or two anyways, but geez, Wormwood? The only place to bed down Bob's screwball self. Ooh, god dang it was that darn mission in, which was barely one step up from a camping trailer in a junkyard. But he could rest there, take a bath there, sleep off the stress of his first real crash. Oh, why the hell not? he said, and drove away, hoping Bob Martell wouldn't flip out totally and start thinking he was a chicken or Napoleon or something. At the outskirts of Wormwood, home of the worms and not much else to Tupper's way of thinking, while rattling along the gravel road dodging chuck hose and collapsed barbed wire fences, the sheriff spotted something else out of the ordinary. Under the glare of his headlights, walking determinedly at the left of the road and looking quite the cowboy, was a tall, bald man wearing a long yellow duster coat and a classic Stetson. The heels of his snakeskin boots gleamed like oiled glass as he walked. In one hand, he held a small case of some sort, perhaps his toilet items if he needed to stop and freshen up, before continuing to hike the remaining 500 miles across the desert toward Mexico. Bob Martell, who had been drowsing, perked up. No, nah, it ain't him, he said after a beat. Maybe it's the other one. Tupper had no idea which was supposed to be which, but flashed the overhead light bar on and off a couple times anyhow. The man stopped and turned. Tupper idled up and rolled his window down a few more inches. How do, he said by way of greeting when the dust had settled. Have you seen him? The man asked immediately. He had a long, somewhat triangular face, bald head, Generic eyes, no apparent criminal intent, just another tall guy wearing 800 bucks worth of cowboy clothes, hiking through the night on the outskirts of Wormwood. Happened all the time. Seen who? Tupper ventured. Bob Martell perked up again. It is you, he said, leaning across the seat and sticking his face an inch away from Tupper's ear. You, except, where'd you get the clothes? Sheriff Tupper and the stranger made eye contact again. Silent agreement ensued. The deputy was bonkers. Tupper pushed Martell back with a shove of his elbow. Let me do this, he snapped. To the stranger, he said, Did you witness a car wreck about a half hour ago, out on the highway? He nodded. I did. Did you see anyone jump out at the last minute? He nodded again. That would be the man I'm looking for, yes. You saw this man jump out. You were close enough to see. The stranger put a hand on the top of the car and began to drum his fingers there. Thumpa, thumpa, thumpa. Of course I was. I was in the Cadillac. Tupper looked at Martell, who was gnawing on a fingernail now and back to the cowboy. You came out of that explosion alive? <laughs> that would be impossible. I was able to get out before the gas tanks exploded. But your car was totaled. Worse than totaled. I explained this to your partner already. Rather than ask me why I'm not as dead as you'd like, ask me why I have to find Breaker and find him tonight. Tupper blinked. Baker? Breaker. B-R-A-Y-K-E-R. -E Breaker. Yeah, okay, I, I get it, I got it. Tupper ran a hand over his face feeling worse than he had when Mavis rang his telephone to fire the starter gun for this stupid night. Hop on in, we can clear this up in town. The stranger opened the back door and climbed in. Bob Martell turned and eyed him up and down, mumbling to himself, until Tupper poked a finger hard against his thigh and mouthed a couple shut-ups. The stranger leaned forward to speak to the back of Tupper's head as the sheriff gave gas for the last go to Wormwood. He's a very dangerous man, Breaker is, he said. He's a murderer and a thief, I should tell you. Tupper ducked a little as he drove. The man's breath was wafting around his head, smelled a lot like burnt rubber. Eight hundred bucks worth of clothes, Tupper thought, and he can't afford a breath mint? Please don't be telling me that you're a cop, Tupper said. Please don't tell me you're some kind of New York detective chasing the mafia in the Diamond County. Actually, I'm just a salesman. Salesman, eh? Okay, Mr. Salesman. What drove you all the way from the East Coast into New Mexico? And if he says my Cadillac drove me, Tupper thought darkly, 
I'll be forced to arrest him. Oh, Mr. Breaker stole something of great value, he said instead, a valuable antique that is worth an enormous amount to me. And if he is anywhere near one of your quaint little towns, bad things will begin to happen. Dangerous things, I assure you. Tupper let his eyes drift shut for a moment. Thieves, murderers, salesmen, what's the difference? A voice squawked on the police channel. Tupper got the mic and thumbed the button. Go ahead, Mavis. The radio was no top-of-the-line Motorola or RCA job, but he was used to its garbled crackling. That's a 10-4, he said, and looked in the rearview mirror. Reflected from the back seat, the salesman's eyes were bright circles. His eyebrows arched with interest. That was HQ, Tupper said. Somebody just tried to steal a car out of the Eureka Cafe parking lot. The salesman frowned. Where might that be? Well, Tupper said, it might be in Wormwood, and that might be the hole-in-the-wall town just up ahead. And it might be that your thief is already doing his dirtiest. Works fast, don't he? The salesman smiled a thin, satisfied smile. Very fast, Sheriff. May I say the same for your driving now? You may, Tupper replied primly and poured on the gas. Uncle Willie had done some passing out in his life and had later awakened to some hangovers that would drop an elephant like a bullet between the eyes. But this one, as he awakened from a nap of no more than 20 or 30 seconds, was right up there among the top 10. The top 5, even. Aquanet hangovers were a special piece of hell always reserved for the topmost slots. He was staggering to his feet while assorted horses and mules kicked him in the head, or so it seemed. Crazy lights danced inside his eyeballs, and his ears were full of steam engines chugging away and atomic bombs going off at random. When he realized he was erect, he slumped against the nearest object, the gas station, and began giving serious thought to religion, perhaps even Mormonism or Christian science. A few yards away, another shape was coming to its feet. The smell of spilled gasoline was in the wind. A flicker of distant lightning exposed the scene for a millisecond during the storm. Willie cracked an eye open in time and saw a dead gas station bedecked with the uh, errant newspaper comics, tumbleweeds, and a flapping sandwich board sign that proclaimed gas to be $1.64 a gallon. Propped against the wall, he opened his mouth and spit out a blot of something salty. He remembered being scared, remembered being hit by a car or a falling tree. He lifted a hand and clutched his forehead against the forces that wanted it to split wide open. A car? A tree? His upper lip was torn and bleeding from the inside, and a hot spot on the side of his head spoke of goose eggs and concussions, brain hemorrhages approaching death. Worse, his can of hairspray had rolled all the way on the wet street. He grunted. Shit! Oh! Shit in my head! Oh, ow! The other shape in the dark was on its feet now. Its shoes scraped on the asphalt as it wobbled upright and dragged itself inexorably toward Uncle Willie once more. One outstretched hand had a tiny spot on the palm that shone and winked with the hideous greenish light of its own. Devil! Devil! Willie screamed at it. The wind tore at his ragged clothes and stood his white hair on ends. Devil! Uncle Willie hesitated. The figure tottered to the right and slumped against the building a few steps away. It sagged an inch or two and said, I didn't see you in the dark, old fella. Sorry. Uncle Willie hesitated, mentally pocketing a whole string of imprecations that might have captured him the hobo equivalent of an Emmy. He breathed easier, then clutched wildly at a pocket buried inside his wadded clothes. There was a pint of whiskey in there, and it was not broken. He fumbled it out with shaking fingers and partook of a long series of gargling-sounded swigs. I could, I could sue you, he wheezed as he replaced the cap and ran his tongue over his lacerated lip, which now burned like Drano in the old eyeball. Beloved booze began immediately to wash through his system, erasing the remnants of panic. 
However, I like courts and lawyers about as much as I like spiders in my shoes when I put them on. Care to drink with me? The dark and frightening figure stepped close and even in the bad light became an ordinary man. He had a bloody nose that he swiped at with the sleeve as he took Willie's bottle and regarded it. Whiskey? He asked. Lightning hit the sky again, and in its brief glow, Uncle Willie saw deep holes for eyes. The urgent need of some shaving cream and a razor and a dark and dirty line of soot smeared like war paint along the lines of that face, which was not a very old face at all. The man put the spout of the bottle in his mouth and tipped his head back. One, two, three swallows, and he was done. Willie thanked the gods of mercy as it was handed back. Since the hairspray was gone, this little bottle was the only thing that stood between him and death by sobriety. What a kind stranger to have drink so little. Uh, so, Willie said, now that a bond of friendship was established, uh, what brings you a young man like yourself here to Wormwood? And at such speed. The man touched his nose again. Wormwood, eh? Quaint. Real quaint. Uh, give me that bottle, please. Willie started to protest, but the unwritten law among professional scavengers dictated that a man may drink twice of your bottle when offered it once, but no more. Willie handed the bottle over without enthusiasm and watched while a good inch of it went down the other man's gullet. I need a, a place to bed down for the night, the man said after lowering the bottle to the height of his belt. Know any place I could uh, do that? Bed down? Willie's eyes were locked onto the bottle. Barely three, maybe four inches left. Did this man know what he was doing? Was he king of the road enough to know the rules? There's but one public house left in Wormwood, fella, Willie said. It's called the Mission Inn. I can direct you to it from here. Oh? Yeah, Willie began pointing around. The storm raged on across the tossing sky, as if unsure of which way it should go. More lightning erected tiny ladders far out on the prairie beyond the town. Uh, you see that sign? It used to be a grocery store. One block past it is the building that used to be a motel before they rerouted the highway and uh, put us off the beaten track. There, would, uh, there you would take a left and look for Mission Street in about six, maybe seven blocks. Uh, the street signs have mostly fallen, but you can uh, tell Mission Street because... His voice trailed off. The dark stranger with the weird shiny dot on his palm had hoisted the bottle to his lips in a sudden move and was drinking again. Now see here, Willie snapped. I offered you a drink in the name of friendship, yet here you stand swilling my liquor like root beer. The man lowered the bottle and eyed Willie. Take me there, he said. Willie straightened. What? Take me there. He gripped the bottle by the neck and waved it in front of Willie's face, sloshing its delicate innards. Take me to your godforsaken hotel. Let me close my eyes and sleep until I die. Willie took a backward step. Sir, you only have to walk nine or ten blocks from where we stand and you'll be there. Beware, he shouted, advancing a step. Where it might be safe, where I can rest... Where I do not have to deal with this every moment of my life? His free hand swung up and stopped a few inches in front of Willie's face. The one dot of green light pulsated, pulsated, then shifted slightly. It went out. And I, the man said wearily as he dropped his hand and looked at it, must once again fight unto the death again. Willie stood mute. This was a lunatic facing him here, a young man carrying a host of demons in his soul. Many hobos finally went senile or insane after years of bad booze and lousy nutrition, he knew. But for this poor fellow, the time had come far too early. Overdoses of hairspray could well be the culprit. Okay, okay, Willie said, straightening his shoulders. I'll take you to the mission. They know me there and you'll get a bed. With the sudden move of his arm, the man gave up possession of the bottle of whiskey by thumping it against Willie's chest. I only ask for one night's sleep, he muttered, hanging his head. One night's sleep before we all die. Willie took the bottle. 
He put one gnarled hand on the stranger's shoulder, but immediately felt sheepish and let it fall. Oh, just follow me, he said. You got a name I can use? Breaker, he said. There's a Y in it. Breaker with a Y. And for God's sake, it isn't Baker. I swear it isn't Baker. Don't ever call me Baker. Never have and never will, uh-huh, Uncle Willie said and aimed himself toward the abandoned grocery store that would lead to the abandoned motel, which would lead to Mission Street, where the sign that proclaimed its name had long ago fallen down and would never rise again. They walked. For lack of anything to say, Willie told him tales of his olden days as an investor in silver mines, up to the part where the truth got blurry and the booze took over. But this guy Breaker, and don't ever call him Baker, didn't seem to be listening. So as they walked in the rain, Willie decided to shut up and went to work on his last few inches of whiskey. Chapter 4 Danny Long, who had been so proud of himself for stopping the theft of his parents' Bronco at the Eureka Cafe, was not the only young person dying a slow death in the decayed remains of Wormwood, New Mexico, the place where everybody left and nobody bothered to come back. The name attached to her probation file identified her as Geraldine A. Bescom, 20-year-old white female with a record of many enterprising activities such as robbery, burglary, grand theft auto, and possession of controlled substances, to mention a few. In a big city, such a record would have surprised few, but in the tiny towns of the southwest, this kind of behavior was utterly scandalous. Eighteen months in prison had hardened Geraldine a little around the edges, and taught her a lot. Lesson one, don't trust anybody. Lesson two, don't ever, ever wind up in prison again even if it means being a paid slave at the Mission Inn in Wormwood. And it amounted to slavery, really. As part of her work release probation, Geraldine was paid $2.30 an hour to be the mission's maid, cook, laundry worker, desk clerk, delivery driver, groundskeeper, and cleaning lady. The owner of the Mission Inn was Irene Galvin, who liked hiring WR slash P's because they would work long and hard. Too long and too hard just to stay out of prison. If not for the cheap labor, Geraldine had decided long ago the Mission Inn would be out of business in a month, less even. One thing that helped keep the mission alive at all was the fact that the building itself was a defunct Baptist church that Irene Galvin had bought, interest-free on a home-drawn contract for almost nothing per month. Irene was a shrew and a hag and a bunch of other nasty stuff, but she was cunning. The only people left in the town were the poorest, the ones who had no house to sell, no job to relocate to, no future. They couldn't afford to move away, didn't have anyone to rent an apartment from, as everything in Wormwood had folded and needed a place to stay until Lady Luck might spirit them away to a better life. A boarding house, then. Irene Galvin saw the need for a boarding house, bought the church for pennies, had it remodeled in exchange for the carpenter's room and board for a year, and set up shop. How she had latched on to the idea of using work-release cons as labor, Geraldine would never know. The nearest women's prison was clear off in Colorado. Perhaps they ran newspaper ads. Tonight, as life at the Mission Inn was winding towards bedtime, Geraldine was, as ordered, wiping down the big dining table with Lemon Pledge. Irene Galvin had acquired the idea that Lemon Pledge was an antiseptic. Irene Galvin had a lot of blank spaces in her brain for someone so smart. Geraldine was wearing her usual jeans and cowboy shirt as she worked, and the usual canvas apron Irene made her wear. She was not a bad-looking girl, had been a junior varsity cheerleader in school before kissing that whole scene goodbye, but with her yellow hair tied up in a greasy bandana, her face sans makeup and shiny with sweat, she looked stooped and middle-aged. The current house guests were parked in front of the old round tube color TV Irene had picked up at a yard sale years before. The sound didn't work anymore, but the boarders were used to it. From what Geraldine was picking up as a conversation ebbed and flowed in front of the ancient Philco, one of the long-term boarders, screwy little Wally Enfield, had gotten fired today from his post office job in Lost Mesa. 
This was tragic news both to Wally and to Irene. If one or two more boarders headed for greener pastures, the mission in would financially wash ashore like a dead mackerel on a beach, which might mean back to the pokey with Geraldine. But Wally, the only female resident was saying, how could they fire you? You didn't do anything. Wally had sunk himself into a corner of the sofa, and if he sunk himself any lower in his distress, Geraldine thought wickedly only his shoes would be poking up. That's what I told them, Wally whined. I don't know what happened to all that mail. Far as I know, it just disappeared. The female resident, who Geraldine could barely stand, was Cordelia Jackson, the former elementary school teacher who became a prostitute as soon as the school closed its doors, and perhaps long before it had been said. It is simply unjust, she hummed to the demoralized Wally. A man like you, a man like you. Wally covered his face with his hands and spoke through his fingers. God, it was so humiliating. The postmaster ripped off my name tag right in front of everyone, and then, like it wasn't bad enough, he took my Mr. Zippy patch and cut it up with scissors. Intolerable, Cordelia Jackson said in a voice husky with righteousness. You should have told him to go fuck himself. You should have reported him to the Postmaster General. You still could, too. It was then that Irene breezed in from inspecting the kitchen that Geraldine had just finished scrubbing down. Bulging fatly in all the wrong places in her antiquated green pantsuit, she crossed in front of the television while maneuvering two toothpicks between her lips. Wally, she said loudly, if you've got any sense, you'll crawl your ass back there in the morning and beg God above for your job back. People are killing each other for post office jobs. You've read the papers. Actually, Wally said, those killings were of a different nature. Nature smature, Irene snorted. Go back to your boss and offer, offer to suck some body parts. Cordelia nodded. It never hurts to grease the wheels. Geraldine almost laughed out loud. Bent over while sanitizing the chairs, she managed to package it into a large and sloppy cough. Cordelia, who had most surely sucked a few body parts since giving up teaching, snapped her head around. Don't you be laughing at him, Geraldine, jailbait Bascombe. Have you got my sheets washed yet? Geraldine raised her head. Yep, they're all downstairs. I couldn't get the stains all the way out, though. The whole mess looks kind of, uh, green. Cordelia rolled her eyes. Never again will I work with guacamole, no matter how much he pays me. And Geraldine? Geraldine stood erect, hating the smell of the pledge and quite willing to set the rag on fire if asked. The table, too, come to think of it. Yeah? Cordelia smiled one of her phony smiles at her. I've got a date coming here real soon, she said. Be a sport and put the sheets on my bed while I freshen up. All in good time, Geraldine said. After this, I've still got the stove to clean. Irene, who had plopped her green suit itself on the sofa beside Wally and was going at her teeth with both of her toothpicks, pulled her eyes away from the silent TV long enough to bark a command. Paying customers are always right, Geraldine. Put the goddamn sheets on Cordelia's bed before her boyfriend shows up. Geraldine allowed her eyes to go out of focus, turning everything inside the mission into a blur of mismatched colors with the voiceless TV, a bright spot of flashing lights just to the right. This place was like a nut house most of the time. Cordelia was a cheap whore with visions of Hollywood and its money and scandals. Irene was a cheap boarding house owner. Wally Enfield was a weasley little shit who had been unjustly and terribly fired from every job he'd ever had. There were four other residents, two of them now missing for three days and assumed in jail again. The other two gone off on some madcap venture prospecting for silver in an area that had been stripped clean of silver and everything else before the turn of the century. They could all show up at any time and demand food. Who would be rousted from bed to cook it? The Big J. As the storm continued outside, Wally Enfield decided now to uproot himself from the sofa and become the rescuer of a damsel in distress. I'll get your sheets for you, he said regally to Cordelia as he stood, and I'll put them on your bed. Cordelia eyed him. That's a sweetheart, 
she said. Go ahead and do that. Get those sheets. She looked over to Geraldine. Isn't he just sweet, isn't he? Geraldine finished wiping the last chair and shoved it into place. Wally, she announced without much enthusiasm, you are the sweetest of the sweet. The laundry is in the basement. He blushed to the top of his balding little head and got interested in the tips of his shoes. Cordelia touched a finger to her chin and stared at him while mental gears seemed to be at work behind her eyes. Isn't he just the sweetest? She murmured wonderingly. Isn't he? Irene, who had been busy picking her teeth with dull toothpicks, went for a rearward molar while raising a leg to let a short, shrill fart whistle between her legs. Sweet, she grunted. Oh, so sweet. Wally wandered away, becoming so lobster red with embarrassment that Geraldine feared a tourniquet around his neck might be necessary soon. Cordelia squealed out a twitter of laughter. Did you ever see such? She asked, slapping the arm of the couch. Did you? I should give him a freebie. And you know, if Roach doesn't show up tonight, I will. You bet I will. Oh, that's just what little Wally needs, Irene muttered back. Getting screwed again. A gust of damp air kicked across Geraldine's shins, followed by the spiritless clinking of the cowbell hanging above the front door. A familiar pile of rags walked in. Uncle Willie. Trailing him was a stranger whose thick black hair had been worked into knots by the wind and the rain and the storm outside, whose clothes were wet and dirtier than most, whose face was tied and distrusting. An image sprang instantly into her mind. Prison guard, tough, weary, and sick of it all. Well, looky here, Uncle Willie brayed as the door spring tried to pull the door shut against the weather. Gangway, I'm bringing in business. Cordelia frowned, eyeing the stranger. What kind of business? My kind of business? Well, actually, Willie said, more like Irene's business. He's looking for a private room. Geraldine watched Irene Galvin push herself off the couch to greet the sight of a new paying customer. Why, Uncle Willie, Irene giggled and stroked his hairy cheek as he rounded past him. Had I known you would be bringing me some business, I never would have said the things I did. Do forgive me. Willie frowned. What things? What? What? And how shall I register you? She asked the man. Monthly? Yearly? There is no better long-term accommodation in New Mexico than the friendly family here at Mission Inn. Are you new to the area? Just give me a room, he said. Geraldine noticed a thin crust of dried blood under his nose as if he had been in the fight and scrubbed at it a lot. He ran a hand through his hair. A bed, a room, one night, two nights, bill me later. Irene Galvin snapped suddenly into her more familiar personality. I don't do short-term rents, mister. This is not a motel where you check in and then out. I serve meals here, I have an entertainment center here, and I have to make a profit here in order to survive. One week minimum paid in advance. The man took a slow, purposeful breath. Across the room, Geraldine was already writing the whole episode off and mentally preparing herself to tackle the cleaning of the stove. Irene had chased one-nighters away before. It was nothing new. Here, she heard the stranger say, You want, what, fifty, two fifty, ten thousand goddamn fifty? Here. He raked a hand in and out of his jeans pocket as fast as a gunslinger unlimbering a Colt 45. The wad of bills he pulled out was very round and very fat. Geraldine almost gasped. The visible ones were fifties. A couple others looked like hundreds as they lazily uncoiled from the roll in his open hand. She had never seen a thousand dollar bill but guessed there might be a few at the core of such a treasure. Irene, acting as if this took place every single day, remained prim. One hundred dollars per night will be fine, sir. She plucked at the sheaf of bills, her bony little fingers tweezing and pecking like the beak of a chicken. Geraldine, she barked when she was done, show this gentleman to the available room. Geraldine propped her hands on her hips. I thought cleaning the stove was a matter of life and death. Irene swept the man toward the front desk, produced for him a guest register, which had never seen the light of day at all during the entire five months Geraldine had worked here, and produced enough verbal syrup to coax him into signing it. 
When he laid the pen down, Irene raised a hand over her head and began snapping her fingers. Geraldine, Geraldine, dear, show Mr. Breaker to his room, please. Number five should be perfect. Geraldine put the lemon pledge down on the table, wiped the palms of her hands on the sides of her jeans, and became the mission in bellboy, which she had not known until now was part of her work release probation agreement. Amazing how varied and sundry such programs were, and how they could expand themselves into a bit of everything. In a few years, she could head the Wormwood City Council as a local work release mayor. As if Wormwood had a city council, that was. Har har. This way to the presidential suite, she groused. Any carry-on luggage for this flight, Mr. Breaker? Irene clicked her tongue. Geraldine, loose lips sink work release ships. Keep your smart mouth to yourself and see to it that Mr. Breaker gets some supper. Yes, ma'am, Geraldine said curtly. Mr. Breaker walked this way. She turned and goose-stepped a couple paces, looking back for a grin from Mr. Breaker. She got only a cold, dead stare. Mr. Congeniality, he ain't, she muttered under her breath and hiked up the stairs. Room 5 was down the short hallway to the right. She whisked the door open and snapped on the light. Breaker pushed past her and stalked to the window. He studied the night for a moment. Let's see, Geraldine said, tapping her chin. Breakfast starts at 7, maybe later if I oversleep. The bathroom's just down the hall. What am I looking at here? Breaker said to the glass. He tapped at it. Which direction is the highway? Uh, 47 or 16 east-west. 47. She walked up beside him and pointed, squatting a few inches to see. Couple of miles that way, but notice the fine view? This elegant suite features a splendid morning view of nothing. Ditto for afternoons, and the evening view is especially nothing. He looked at her as if puzzled. She reddened. No sense of humor whatsoever, the jerk. Why are you here? He asked suddenly. She arched her eyebrows. Why? To show you the room. Breaker reached and clamped a cold hand around her forearm. Not that. Why the hell are you here? What's here for you? Just a job, she said, shying away. You were in jail, he said. His dark eyes were shiny and emotionless. What did you do? Geraldine frowned at him, the nosy bastard. Thelonious bedwetting, why are you here? He looked back to the window, where the wind was kicking the rain down across the window. I think, he stated wearily, that I'm here for the same reason you are. She snorted. Bedwetting? Simply rampant these days, huh? He waved her away with the flick of his hand. Get out of here and uh, make me some supper. I want a beer with it too, got that? She strode to the door. Got it. And by the way, sir, you can go to hell. I've been there, he said. She slammed the door. Supper time, the usual crew had eaten hours before. Large cube steaks, steamed potatoes, gravy, asparagus, dinner rolls, lemon meringue pie for dessert. The leftovers were pretty skimpy, and Geraldine wanted to make sure Mr. Breaker got enough. So she added a cup of flour to the blender while it churned his entire supper into pudding. She located a large bowl, filled it with the beige-colored Geraldine special, and poked a sprig of fresh parsley into the middle. Superb, she crooned, sniffing it. Mr. Breaker was already at the table. He had washed up and tamed his hair a little, but his clothes were unchanged and his beard stubble was still stubbly. Geraldine breezed out of the kitchen and dropped the bowl and a spoon in front of him. When she cruised back with a glass of water, he was eating slowly and deliberately, his eyes fixed on an invisible spot on the table. She parked the water at his elbow. She curtsied. Is everything satisfactory, Mr. Breaker? He cranked his head to look at her. I wanted a beer, he said. She smiled. And you got water. Enjoy. She joined Uncle Willie and Cordelia at the two sofas aimed at the television, where a black and white rerun of The Fugitive was soundlessly airing. Willie and Cordelia were staring at Breaker as if he were the most interesting thing within a hundred miles. He noticed and lifted his bowl. You two want some or what? 
he said. Cordelia turned her attention back to the television. Uncle Willie winked. No thanks, not me. I was just thinking about how much better that stuff looked when it was roadkill. <laughs> Geraldine covered her mouth with her hands and laughed into them. Mr. Breaker was a weird character, and if he thought the two of them had some kind of common bond, that their meeting here was dictated by fate, well then, he was weird and crazy. Though the wind outside from the storm was hooting and groaning around the building, and the rain was noisily pattering against the roof and windows, Geraldine heard a car crunch its way over the gravel parking area and stop. It had the peculiar squeak rattle of a Volkswagen, she thought. One door thumped shut. One of the rumors back from wherever the hell, or a customer for Mrs. Cordelia and her bedroom talents, Breaker had heard it too. She watched as he tensed up, saw a hand go into his pocket of his dirty jacket. His gaze welded itself to the front door. This man, she realized without surprise, was a man of many secrets. Maybe even an escaped mental patient from the cuckoo house over in Cactus Flowers. Something black blurred through the bottom of her vision without warning. It zipped up onto the table beside Breaker, froze in place and became Irene's cat, Cleo. Breaker burst up from his chair in a wild scramble, knocking it over and nearly upsetting the table. His bowl of Geraldine special wobbled near the edge, but thankfully did not fall off. With one enormous sweep of his arm, Breaker shoved the cat off the table. His face twisted up with revulsion and alarm. Irene appeared out of nowhere in time to witness this. She aimed her eyes at Geraldine. Didn't I tell you to put that cat out, didn't I? Geraldine snapped right back at her. I did. I don't know how she keeps getting back in. Besides, she's your stupid cat, not mine. Just get her out of here. Irene turned to Breaker and attached a smile to her mouth. No harm done, Mr. Breaker. I'm so sorry about that cat. He set the chair back on its feet and sat down. His hands were visibly shaking. Geraldine wondered why, allergic to cats or just afraid of his own shadow. The doorbell chimed and Breaker leapt to his feet again, shoving his hand into his pocket where, no doubt, a small pistol was housed. Irene eyed him momentarily, then went to the door. It burst open before she could touch it. Wind and fog marched in along with a man wearing a yellow rain slicker. He had a wet paper bag in one hand with the top of a bottle sticking up. She here? He brayed. Is she still up? Cordelia grinned. Roach? She jumped up from the couch and scurried to the door. Roachy? She wailed and dumped herself into his arms. You kept me waiting. She chided him after a couple of soupy kisses. He handed the bag to her. The meter ain't running already, is it? Asides, this champagne ought to make it up. She winked at him and pulled the bottle out. Geraldine smirked. A four-dollar bottle of off-brand rock gut. Cordelia unscrewed the top and sniffed. I get all bubbly, she twittered. That's just how I like you, Roach said, and kissed her again. Anyhow, uh, the reason I'm late is because somebody tried stealing Homer's Bronco down at the cafe. Cordelia frowned, capping the bottle. That old pile of shit? Right from the parking lot. Uh, the sheriff is there right now, swear to God. Mercy. Geraldine saw Cordelia's eyes shift over to Breaker and back. He had recovered and was going at supper again with his eyes cast downward, watching nothing. Cordelia twitched her eyebrows at Roach and nodded slightly. Oh, Roach said softly. He took her hand and urged her toward the stairway. Let's get us some privacy. Wally Enfield trudged in from the basement door, toting a basket of folded sheets. He opened his mouth to say something to Cordelia, then saw that she was headed to the stairway with Roach. His face fell so fast, Geraldine was afraid it might drop to the floor. Oh, the scourge of unrequited love. Well, come on, Wally, Cordelia said, motioning to him. Get those sheets on the bed like a dear boy. Wally uttered a great sigh and followed them up. Only a moment later, Roach came down alone. Hey, Irene, he said, doing funny things with his eyes. I gots to make a phone call. Phone's behind the desk, she said. Not that one, uh, this is personal business. Irene snorted. As if walking up the stairs with the town hooker ain't personal. 
Roach gritted his teeth and rolled his eyes. All right, use the one in the office. Swell, he headed the way. Just don't go getting it all smelled up with your booze breath, though, she called after him and plopped down on the sofa beside Geraldine. Ever notice, she said conversationally, that everybody who meets the fugitive winds up helping him hide out? Geraldine looked again to Breaker, hunched and silent. He seemed oblivious to everything but his Geraldine special. He was, she knew now with fair certainty, a fugitive himself. But it would be a cold day in hell before she ever helped him, more than to just drive him to the city limits, say goodbye, and boot his rude ass out of the car. Okay, kitties, this has been chapters 3 and 4 of Tales from the Crypt Presents Demon Knight, the novelization of the film by Randall Boyle. Before I go any further, if you haven't seen this movie before or read this novelization, I may be talking about some spoilers. Just a heads up right now. First things first, I gotta say, <laughs> the cop's child's name is Chucky. And he talks about how it looks like his neighbor with the bright red hair and everything. So, kudos to Randall Boyle for the little child's play reference there. Really enjoyed that. Okay, on with the discussion. But anyways, I want to talk about the chapters from tonight and a lot of the differences we're seeing in this book compared to the movie. Um, a, the whole scene with the uh, cops uh, taking the collector into the car played out a little bit differently. Um, and then when we get to the to the actual hotel, uh, right off the bat, the elephant in the room is Geraldine is in the book. She's like a younger white girl uh, who's been in trouble with the law. Totally doesn't match up with Jada Pinkett Smith's character in the movie. Um, so that's kind of, that's kind of off-putting. It's just so different than what I know of the movie. But what I'm trying to do with this book is separate what I know from the movie and narrate this book the way I would if I was reading this story for the first time. If I had never seen the movie, I just picked up the book. This is how I picture the characters. Um, so you might be listening going, wow, he's not even trying to make that character sound like that character. That's because this is the novelization. This isn't the movie. There's already a movie with that. I'm going to narrate the book based on the way I'm seeing it play out in my head, as if I was reading the book, the way I read the characters, the way I see the characters. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's not a whole lot that happened tonight action-wise. It's really just setting the scene. I mean, we're right on that precipice. Uh, if we go by the events of the movie, which I feel like a lot of things are going to be different in the book... Uh, the way it's looking already, uh, things aren't going the way exactly the way they do in the movie. So it's kind of good that I'm reading this as if I'm reading it the first time because I feel like there's going to be quite a few differences. We've already seen a few and, and one big one uh, already. So yeah, but if we go by the events of the movie, then uh, the collector should be showing up in the next upload and the cops should be with him and this whole thing should go down pretty soon. The meat of the story should be here. If you've never read this book or seen this movie, I'm telling you right now, it may have seemed like filler right here, but there's a reason that they do the character setup in this story uh, because all these character traits of these characters are going to come into play when the shit hits the fan. The fan's blowing right now, and I'm telling you, the shit's about to hit the fan. So I'm really excited for the next chapter or two. I'm really excited for the rest of the book. Let me know what you guys think of the book so far. And if you're enjoying Tales from the Crypt Demon Knight, the novelization. I'll be back very soon with more. Until then, this has been your friendly neighborhood 80 slasher librarian saying, Okay, boils and ghouls, thanks for listening. And I'll see you soon.
The 80s slasher librarian. <laughs> <laughs> 